chaps. Paul Curran here. I hope you and all the listeners are well. Hey Joe, quarter time there. Uh, most often associated with Jimi Hendrix, of course, but I've just been listening to the the Deep Purple version, which is um, is rather good too, and uh, been covered by numerous artists, Patti Smith, Cher amongst them, um, and it's said to have been written by Billy Roberts, although I think there's some questions that remain about the um, the authorship of the song originally. Uh, and uh, it was first released by The Leaves in 1965. Jimi Hendrix's version, of course, places us firmly in the late 1960s. And um, the reason that I start there for this Poetry Corner is that I recently saw the new Martin Scorsese film uh, regarding Bob Dylan's 1975 tour of North uh, North America, the Rolling Thunder Review, which is well worth seeing. It's fascinating for the footage. As a film, a little like the Rolling Thunder Review itself, it seems to lack direction, I think, but um, some of the, the glimpses of the era are, are fascinating. And there's some great cameo appearances. Um, Sharon Stone comes across as being delightful. Bob Dylan is far more relaxed and talkative than he was 10 years prior to that. And um, the general madness is, uh, is, 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 is wonderful to behold. There's one scene where Bob Dylan walks amongst some Native American uh, people who've uh, agreed to entertain him and his cohorts at a reservation and um, I thought that was, was, was particularly um, striking seeing Dylan walking amongst them um, almost a, a biblical figure and one wonders who of similar status at the time would have would have uh, even considered doing such a thing his live performances in that film are tremendous also why do I mention the Rolling Thunder Review. Well, the character who colours the film is Allen Ginsberg. Erwin Allen Ginsberg was an American poet and one of the leading figures of the Beat Generation in the 1950s. He vigorously opposed militarism, materialism and sexual repression. Ginsberg is best known for his epic poem, Howl, in which he celebrated his fellow angel-headed hipsters and harshly denounced what he saw as the destructive forces of capitalism and conformity in the United States. This poem is one of the classic poems of the Beat Generation. The poem, which was dedicated to writer Carl Solomon, opens, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. In October 1955, Ginsberg and the five other unknown poets gave a free reading at an experimental art gallery in San Francisco. Ginsberg's howl electrified the audience. According to fellow poet Michael McClure, it was clear that a barrier had been broken, that a human voice and body had been hurled against the harsh wall of America and its supporting armies and navies and academies and institutions and ownership systems and power support bases. In 1957, Howell attracted widespread publicity when it became the subject of an obscenity trial in which a San Francisco prosecutor argued it contained the subject of filthy, vulgar, obscene and disgusting language. The poem seemed especially outrageous in 1950s America because it depicted both heterosexual and homosexual sex at a time when sodomy laws made homosexual acts a crime in every US state. Howell reflected Ginsburg's own homosexuality and his relationships with a number of men, including Peter Orlovsky, his lifelong partner. Judge Clayton W. Horn ruled that Hal was not obscene, adding, 
Would there be any freedom of press or speech if one must reduce his vocabulary to vapid, innocuous euphemisms? In Howell and in his other poetry, Ginsberg drew inspiration from the epic, free verse style of the 19th century American poet Walt Whitman. Both wrote passionately about the promise and betrayal of American democracy, the central importance of erotic experience and the spiritual quest for the truth of everyday existence. J.D. McClatchy, editor of the Yale Review, called Ginsberg the best known American poet of his generation, as much a social force as a literary phenomenon. McClatchy added that Ginsberg, like Whitman, was a bard in the old manner, outsized, darkly prophetic, part exuberance, part prayer, part rant. His work is finally a history of our era's psyche, with all its contradictory urges. Certainly in the film that I just alluded to, Allen Ginsberg seems like um, a very genial figure, and um, Dylan speaks of his um, great ability as a dancer. Uh, he was a natural um, dancer. I don't know if he was, uh, was taught how to dance. I, I get the impression that it was a bit like his poetry, very free-falling. Ginsberg was a practicing Buddhist who studied Eastern religious disciplines extensively. One of his most influential teachers was the Tibetan Buddhist, the Venerable Chogyam Chungpa, founder of the Naropa Institute, now Naropa University at Boulder, Colorado. At Chungpa's urging, Ginsberg and poet Anne Waldman started a poetry school there in 1974, which they called the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. In spite of his attraction to Eastern religions, the journalist Jane Kramer argues that Ginsberg, like Whitman, adhered to an American brand of mysticism that was, in her words, rooted in humanism and in a romantic and visionary ideal of harmony among men. He lived modestly, buying his clothing in second-hand stores and residing in downscale apartments in New York's East Village. Ginsberg's political activism was consistent with his religious beliefs. He took part in decades of non-violent political protest against everything from the Vietnam War to the war on drugs. The literary critic Helen Wendler described Ginsberg as tirelessly persistent in protesting censorship, imperial politics and persecution of the powerless. His achievements as a writer, as well as his notoriety as an activist, gained him honours from established institutions. Ginsberg's book of poems, The Fall of America, won the National Book Award for Poetry in 1974. Other honours included the National Arts Club Gold Medal and his induction into the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, both in 1979. Ginsberg was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 1995 for his book Cosmopolitan Greetings, poems between 1986 and 1992. I was fortunate enough to hear... Allen Ginsberg, reading from his work, um, I, I was trying to remember when it was. It was, I think, 1995 or 1996. Uh, he, he died um, in 1997. Anyway, the reading took place at the Royal Albert Hall. And um, in memory, all that uh, I, I really recall is towards the end, uh, the stage had, had um, little on it other than a, a rug, a potted plant, um, a wicker chair, and Alan, Alan Ginsberg, not quite as pursuit as, as, as he was in the 60s. And um, towards the end, he said, uh, 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 for, my, for my final piece, I would like to read a ballad, and um, please allow me to introduce my accompanist, Mr. Paul McCartney. And of course, everybody in a packed Royal Albert Hall leant forward and uh, Paul McCartney shuffled on, didn't say anything, as I recall, and uh, had um, a, a bass guitar, not like the, uh, the one he had in the Beatles, not like the violin shaped bass, but um, he came on and um, accompanied Ginsberg and then Julie left. Anyway, let's listen now to some of, um, some of Ginsberg's shorter poems um, that I've found this afternoon. Um, this is called An Eastern Ballad. 
I speak of love that comes to mind. The moon is faithful, although blind. She moves in thought she cannot speak. Perfect care has made her bleak. I never dreamed the sea so deep, the earth so dark, so long my sleep. I had become another child. I wake to see the world go wild. This is Cosmopolitan Greetings by Allen Ginsberg. Stand up against governments, against God. Stay irresponsible. Say only what we know and imagine. Absolutes are coercion. Change is absolute. Ordinary mind includes eternal perceptions. Observe what's vivid. Notice what you notice. Catch yourself thinking. Vividness is self-selecting. If we don't show anyone, we're free to write anything. Remember the future. Freedom costs little in the U.S. Advise only myself. Don't drink yourself to death. Two molecules clanking as against each other require an observer to become scientific data. The measuring instrument determines the appearance of the phenomenal world after Einstein. The universe is subjective. Walt Whitman celebrated person. We are observer, measuring instrument, I, subject, person. Universe is person. Inside skull is vast as outside skull. What's in between thoughts? Mind is outer space. What do we say to ourselves in bed at night, making no sound? First thought, best thought. Mind is shapely. Art is shapely. Maximum information, minimum number of syllables. Syntax condensed. Sound is solid. Intense fragments of spoken idiom, best. Move with rhythm, roll with vowels. Consonants around vowels make sense. Savor vowels. Appreciate consonants. Subject is known by what she sees. Others can measure their vision by what we see. Candor ends paranoia. Finally, from Allen Ginsberg, Father Death Blues. Hey, Father Death, I'm flying home. Hey, poor man, you're all alone. Hey, old daddy. I know where I'm going. Father Death, don't cry anymore. Mama's there underneath the floor. Brother Death, please mind the store. Old Auntie Death, don't hide your bones. Old Uncle Death, I hear your groans. Oh, Sister Death, how sweet your moans. Oh, children, deaths, go breathe your breaths. Sobbing breast will ease your deaths. Pain is gone, tears take the rest. Genius Death, your art is done. Lover Death, your body's gone. Father Death, I'm coming home. Guru Death, your words are true. Teacher Death, I do thank you for inspiring me to sing the blues. Buddha Death, I wake with you. Dharma Death, your mind is new. Sangha Death, we'll work it through. Suffering is what was born. Ignorance made me forlorn. Tearful truths I cannot scorn. Father Breath, once more farewell. Birth you gave was no thing ill. My heart is still, as time will tell. On the last Poetry Corner, you'll remember that I congratulated my friend Ned Denny on winning the Seamus Heaney Prize for his first collection of poetry, Unearthly Toys, which was in the post on its way to me then. I've subsequently read it, and uh, it's an impressive piece of work. I thought it only appropriate to read a few of the short poems of Ned's uh, that, that feature therein. So in no particular order, um, Ned, I'll remind you, was 
born in London in 1975, and he has worked as a postman, art critic, book reviewer, music journalist and gardener, educated at Cambridge. And um, this uh, is his first collection, Unearthly Toys, Poems and Masks, published in February 2018. And um, he's currently working on a version of the Divine Comedy. This is called Mining for Bone. A natural resource of my own, this wealth of bone below the skin, this pale mineral, the blood has hoarded. So far I have managed only needles, idols, have trudged through caves where beasts were praised. I'll persevere, I'll tunnel deep, raise whole cities. It is a rich seam. That poem, when I first read it, reminds me particularly of Digging by Seamus Heaney, which appeared in his first collection, Death of a Naturalist, uh, where he speaks of his fountain pen, squat between his finger and thumb, like a gun. And he looks out of the window and sees his, his old man digging as his father had dug before. And at the end of the poem, almost as a manifesto, he refers to the pen and says, I'll dig with it. Another one of Ned's is Rooms. When thirty spokes put their heads together, or clay is coaxed into a form and baked, you have a wheel that flashes round a hole, and a pot whose treasure is an empty space. We raise a roof and four solid walls to build a house, but we occupy the air. Our being in the world depends upon mastering the use of what isn't there. Who is the potter, pray, and who the pot? From uh, the, the, the Rubaiyat that, that made me uh, think of. I like this. Self-portrait as Tang poet at dusk. This far from the city, one bears no unearthly toy. There's nothing now here or in heaven that does not fly. The blue air's shining lamentations are somehow joy. I'm a domestic terrorist, a walking thought crime. I'm a coin through whose square pupil you can see the sky. From my star dome terrace, I watch the slow dance of time. A day is the merest gauze in which the night is dressed. What need of many books when I have love's live ember? The world is always waving like a departing guest. The waterfall's catastrophe radiates its white each ghost dawn trees the ideogram for remember the unspeakableness of all this is why I write, marvelling how the light can darken and still be light. To catch a thief. You've been dead a generation and yet there you are still, poised and serene and barely more than twenty, divine, unattainable. Incomparable grace, you marry a prince and grow old. When I ride in pursuit of the enemy, though, it's your face on my shield. And I'd like to close today with mention of John Cooper Clark. John Cooper Clark, who was born on the 25th of January 1949, is an English performance poet who first became famous during the punk rock era of the late 1970s when he became known as a punk poet. He released several albums in the late 70s and early 80s and continues to perform regularly. Indeed he does. When he was last at the Warwick Arts Centre, perhaps not the last time, I think he's been recently, but about a year ago I uh, was sitting in the front row of, uh, of the, the full auditorium and I decided to get a copy of my poems, my first book of poems, to John. And the only um, logical way of doing this 
it seemed to me at the time, was to hand it to him in between his curtain calls. He'd already taken a bow and exited the stage, come back on. And then I, uh, I leapt onto the stage to give him my book. I didn't quite realise how high the apron of the stage was. And I think the last thing he expected was um, somebody to come rushing on. And to be honest, I did see the, um, <laughs> the look of uh, terror flash across his eyes. But um, he kept his cool and uh, received my book, which he's probably now using as a beer mat. Uh, anyway, in my uh, my second book of poems, I do reference John Cooper Clark uh, as I reference Ed Clark, who you'll remember um, has been working on the Psalms. Uh, one I describe as a connoisseur, the other as a saboteur. And I think you'll see from hearing these poems of John Cooper Clark that um, it's he that's... Uh, uh, I think he'd be quite pleased to be referred to as a saboteur. This is called Hire Car. Double park, don't lock the door, push the pedal through the floor, give it loads and then some more, it's a hire car, baby. Excuse me. It's a hire car, baby. Grip the stick, grind the gears, watch that distance disappear. Never yours in a thousand years. It's a hire car, baby. Hire car, hire car. Why would anybody buy a car? Bang it, prang it. Say to tar, it's a hire car, baby. Bad behaviour on the street. Save yourself a couple of sheets. Collision rate keeps it sweet. It's a hire car, baby. Show this motor no respect. Bump it, dump it, call collect. What else do the firm expect? It's a hire car, baby. Drive the... Uh, uh, anywhere. Just like you don't care. Put it down. It'll wear and tear. It's a hire car, baby. Pray the person who hired it last didn't drive it quite so fast. This dacrum dodgem doesn't last. It's a hire car, baby. Try not to kill yourself or injure anybody else. Don't forget to fasten your belts. Rent it, dent it, bang it, prang it, bump it, dump it, scorch it, torch it. Crash and burn it. Don't return it. Lost deposit. Let them learn it. Who cares? It's on the firm. It's a hire car, baby. Here's another that jumped off the page. This is called Never seen a nipple in the Daily Express. You never see a nipple in the Daily Express. I've seen the poison letters of the horrible hacks about the yellow peril and the reds and the blacks and the TUC and its treacherous acts. Kremlin money. All right, Jack. I've seen our democracy is under duress, but I've never seen a nipple in the Daily Express. I've seen the suede jack boot, the verbal cosh, White House, white law, whitewash, blood uptown where the vandals rule, classroom... Mafia, scandal school, they accuse, I confess, but I've never seen a nipple in the Daily Express. Angry columns, scream in pain, love in vain. Domestic strain, divorce, disease, it eats away, the family structure day by day, in the grim pursuit of happiness. I've never seen a nipple in the Daily Express. This paper's boring, mindless mean, full of pornography, the kind that's clean where William Hickey meets Michael Caine again and again and again and again. I've seen millionaires on the DHSS, but I've never seen a nipple in the Daily Express. Perhaps my favourite of uh, John Cooper Clark's is Haiku. Uh, let me apologise for the, um, the, the, uh, the text messages that I've just received should have had my phone turned off. Um, so yes, haiku. Well, as I understand it, haikus are short poems um, that um, strive to suggest a, a mood or a feeling. And um, I remember reading that the middle line of the three um, can be removed and uh, is representative of the whole and uh, the poem should still stand without it. And also I thought I had read that haikus rarely have titles, um, though of course these things uh, aren't, uh, aren't set in stone. So, Haiku by John Cooper Clarke. To convey one's mood in 17 syllables is very difficult. Ned in Unearthly Toys had 
written a haiku. Uh, he tells me that it's striking how many people mention this poem of his called May. Birds in immaculate trees, gossiping of God, his outrageous ways. You are like nature, that once I knew I liked you, and now I haiku. That was one of mine. <laughs>